Hello and welcome once again to the Blueprint Canada's Conservative Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Schmell, Member of Parliament for Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Lakesbrock in the beautiful province of Ontario. I'm broadcasting live today from our nation's capital as we discuss the return of Parliament or whatever form it is the Liberals want to see the legislature return in. And of course, Conservatives are standing up tight against this. And of course, I'll be talking to Candace Bergen, the House Leader for which is the Conservative Party up in that great territory. We'll be talking to him about his plans for the official opposition and hopefully their jump into power once again in the Yukon legislature. And as mentioned, of course, you can always follow us on Facebook. You can like us, subscribe, comment, share. If you're watching us, that's awesome. You can also listen to us on our podcast in platforms like CastBox, Google Play Music, iTunes, Spotify, you name it, we're there. We're all working together to push back against the ever-moving Liberal agenda. So right now we have the Member of Parliament for Portage Liscar from the amazing province of Manitoba. Thank you so much, Candice Bergen, for joining us today. Great to be with you. I'm also in Ottawa. I'm, uh, I'm live from my office here in West Block. And I'm over in Valor Building, so uh, I'll, I'll wave to you from the window. Well, we'll probably see each other very soon in question period, which is coming up shortly. Absolutely. So I won't keep you too long. So let's talk about the recall of Parliament. We have the Liberals again trying to play a few games as to what they want Parliament to be. Uh And of course, we're pushing for one option. Maybe you can just update our listeners what the situation is. Sure. Well, Jamie, I think what we've seen uh, over the last couple of months and especially recently is Trudeau and the Liberals do not want Parliament back. They don't want to be accountable. We've had to bring them kicking and screaming into even having some uh, question period types of uh, of sessions. And so every time we're suggesting that either we have uh, more accountability with uh, some extended question sessions or as we recently have, have done, and that is said, we want parliament back, not a committee, but actual parliament so that we can do our job as opposition, especially during this pandemic. Every time we do that, the Liberals say no. And again, they've said no. They always need a dance partner, though, because they're in a minority parliament. And so the NDP are tagging uh, together with the Liberals. And so they are basically forcing us to yet again abandon parliament. Now, we are here, Conservatives are here in Ottawa fighting this motion. And uh, they probably will win because they've got their dance partner. But we'll end up having a virtual and uh, in-sitting committee. It won't be Parliament, but Conservatives will participate and do our very best, as we've been doing, to hold them to account and try to get better results for Canadians. Well, it was an interesting tactic we heard, I guess it was last week, from the Bloc Québécois, who who came out with their wish list of demands, which was more money into Quebec for the most part. And if they didn't get what they asked for, well, they'll actually do their jobs and come back to Ottawa. I've never seen that used as a bargaining chip before. It was crazy. But yeah, both the Bloc and the NDP, it's just about spending more money. That's always what they're, they're always asking for more money, more money, more money to be spent. And the Liberals seem quite happy to do that uh, and continue to rack up the deficit. But yes, the Bloc, I'll tell you, Gilles Doucette must just be like, you know, un, uh, he cannot believe, I'm sure, what's happened to this Bloc party. Because these guys don't want to come to work. And they actually threatened to come to work. If you don't give us what we want... We're going to be, you know, really give it to you and we're going to come to work. You think, what What did they tell everybody, including the Liberals? I, I would say the same thing for the Liberals when they were knocking on doors to, during the election. We want you to vote for us, but we actually don't want to have Parliament sitting. Uh, I, I wish they would have been honest, but they haven't been. And we are literally the only party that is calling for Parliament to come back. Conservatives are the only one who are who are willing, ready and able to work whenever we need to. Now, I think uh, we should clarify, too, because even today in the debate, we've, hear, we've been hearing liberals say uh, conservatives want 338 members of parliament back. But that's not true. Not once, not ever did we say that. Not at all. That's another one of Trudeau's lies that the media, some of the media have been repeating. We've actually put a motion, uh, presented a motion that uh, whereby we use the number 50. We thought 50 is a reasonable amount and that would be a total amount. So that would be 17 or 18 conservatives and then a proportional number of liberals, NDP bloc. Uh, because we think that that's reasonable, we would be happy to negotiate if health uh, directives would say less should be there. We are absolutely fine with that. And then we could increase that number 
as uh, the province of Ontario begins to open up. But of course, in a responsible way, we have never said 338 of us should be here. But you look at what we've done even the last two days or other times when we've had to pass legislation, Parliament has sat and it can work and it can be effective. But these Liberals don't want Parliament to sit. Trudeau doesn't want the accountability. He doesn't want to get asked the questions. He loves going out of his cottage every single morning doing the Trudeau show. The media just laughing it all up. You know, you know who the CBC and, and, and our friends at the CBC just giving him a free ride day after day. He doesn't want to come back to Parliament at all. No, and, and even the money he is blowing out the door, and, and rightfully so, we've been calling for improvements to different projects, but these are hundreds of billions of dollars in some cases, and it's going through with very little scrutiny and very little questions asked about programs, how they can be tweaked to better serve Canadians. But th this is just going out every day, more money, and, and there is no scrutiny. No scrutiny, no uh, fiscal update. We don't know what does the budget look like. I mean, we know what the PBOs told us, and we have um, you know, nightmares about how massive the deficit it's going to be. There's no fiscal update. There's no opportunity for our opposition days whereby we can bring forward uh, our, some of our requests. Like, for example, we believe the Auditor General should be able to audit all of this spending. Because, listen, we, we remember the sponsorship scandal. And we know what Liberals do when they have massive amounts of money, they're doling out very little scrutiny. I think this needs to be audited, which is what Conservatives are calling for, but also that the Auditor General be financed and be funded for this so that they, they can do their work. But we're not going to have the opportunity to bring that forward because we are not in Parliament. We are having a committee. I, I call it fake Parliament. You know, he's a fake feminist He's fake a lot of things, and now he's going he's gonna to tell everybody he's in a fake parliament, but it's not parliament. Even the Liberals' argument, you know, members of parliament are working, and that's true. Whether they're in Ottawa or back in their constituencies, that is true. But how legislation gets scrutinized, how it gets examined and debated, ideas from one side to the other point, counterpoint, that's all done in parliament. And, yeah. and the fact that we, we are being sidelined from doing our jobs as the official opposition but also, as you mentioned earlier, how frustrating it is that there are other opposition parties who would rather just not come to Ottawa at all. Well, the NDP uh, and the Bloc, I think, have really shown their stripes uh, over the last few months on this. And uh, they would they would rather go home um, and, I, I don't know, sit around and just try to get, get more money for special interest groups. So it's frustrating, but we have a great team. Uh, I can tell you our Conservative caucus has been working harder than ever both in Ottawa and in their writings. And I am so proud and grateful to be able to work with fellow Conservatives who are not only common sense, responsible, want to be responsible with taxpayers' dollars, but have an amazing and tremendous work ethic. And that's what I've seen with, as House Leader, you know, I, I have the privilege of, of helping lead the team in the chamber and seeing people here willing to work you know, we all feel such a responsibility to stand up for our, for our constituents. And so Conservatives are going to keep doing the job and make no mistake, we will not let these Liberals get away with what they're doing. And, and we're going to keep asking questions. We're going to keep fighting. We're going to keep talking about this um, right up and through to the next election. Candice, you're doing an amazing job as House Leader. I, I don't envy the job because it is tough, especially when you're going against people who, who don't actually want to be in Ottawa to scrutinize some of this spending. So any parting words before I let you go? Just, I'm just so grateful. I know we're all grateful. I'm sure, Jamie, you get messages from people across the country who support what we're doing. And I know I just am so grateful for all of the words of support, whether it's on social media, um, emails. But I would encourage people... If you are in a riding where you have a Liberal or an NDP member of Parliament, phone their office, phone often, tell them you're not happy with what they're doing and that they need to get to work in Parliament. And don't let them tell you it's Parliament. It's not Parliament. It's a committee. So to, to your listeners, thanks for your support. You have something that you can do and, and we need you to do it. Thank you very much, Candace Berger, the House Leader for the official opposition. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Jamie. He's also the Member of Parliament for Portage Liscar in the beautiful province of Manitoba. Coming up next, we have Curry Dixon. He's the new leader of the Yukon Party, leading up the Conservative side in the official opposition, hopefully making that jump to government and, of course, Premier very shortly in the upcoming uh, territorial election. So remember, you can listen to us on Spotify, Google Play, iTunes, uh, CastBox, you name it. 
Please like, subscribe, comment, share, and we will all together push back against the ever-moving liberal agenda. So stay tuned for part two. And as always, remember, low taxes, less government, more freedom. That's the blueprint. Welcome back to part two of the Blueprint, Canada's conservative podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Schmail, member of parliament for Halliburton, fourth alleged rock in the beautiful province of Ontario. I'm broadcasting live from our nation's capital as we try to get parliament back to work. Our first guest was Candace Bergen, the official uh, opposition's house leader, to tell us a bit about the process that's going on in the battle we as conservatives are having, trying to get the other opposition parties to show up in Ottawa for work. But now we have an amazing guest for us here on part two. We have Curry Dixon. He's the new leader of the Yukon party up in that great territory. Thank you so much for joining us and congratulations. Hi, Jamie. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. I'm a, I'm a fan of the, the podcast and, and I'm so happy to be joining you today. Well, I'm hoping to at some point join you again and say hello and go over the priorities together that you're working on, just so our viewers and listeners know. So you were first elected in 2015, you decided not to run in 2000, or sorry, 2011, you decided not to run in 2015. You are, as far as I'm, I know, still the youngest cabinet minister in the Yukon's history. So congratulations. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So, yeah. I I ran in 2011. I was an NLA and cabinet minister for five years and, and then uh, chose not to run in the 2016 election, uh, which was our last election. And I, uh, spend the, I spent the, the last few years in the private sector uh, working in the mining industry up here. So as you settle into the, the job, the new job, um, what's, what's on tap? What do you have lined up? What's what's well, look, happening first? Well, look, uh, J Jamie, let me tell you, first of all, that we had uh, an incredible leadership election uh, over the past few weeks. Obviously, it's been colored uh, considerably by the pandemic and some of the challenges associated with that. But we had an unprecedented level of engagement. We have a record high uh, party membership now as a result of this leadership election. And we had uh, over 96% voter turnout in our last leadership election, which is, which is absolutely huge. Uh, obviously, that was uh, conducted almost entirely online and by phone, which is uh, pretty unique, uh, but necessary given the circumstances we were in. Uh, and we had three really, really strong leadership candidates. Uh, the two folks that I ran against were, were Brad Cathers, a, a sitting MLA, and, and Linda Benoit, a former party president of ours, uh, both who brought a, a lot to the table. And uh, we had a really strong uh, leadership election that really engaged people. And I think Yukoners are ready for change here. They're getting tired of this liberal government and its uh, lack of accountability and decision making. And, uh, you know, I was, I was, uh, I thought it was very interesting to hear from from MP Bergen there about uh, what's going on in Ottawa because it's very similar to what's going on up here in Whitehorse. So tell me about tell me, the provincial or the territorial legislature. What is going on? Are you sitting? Are you not sitting? Are there talks to get back to action? Tell us a bit about that. Well, uh, it seems that the Liberals in the Yukon are taking a page of the Liberals' book in Ottawa. We have uh, Parliament or legislature was suspended uh, when the pandemic uh, first began. And uh, the premier committed at that point to, to uh, you know, allow for some sort of scrutiny of his budget uh, as it was passed back in, in uh, the early days of the sitting. Since then, they have refused to bring back uh, the legislature. Uh, the, both the NDP and the Yukon Party, uh, their MLA and their caucuses, have uh, requested strenuously to, to bring back the legislature uh, and allow some amount of public scrutiny of these uh, incredible unilateral decisions that, been, that they have been making, the millions and millions of dollars that they have been spending, uh, all of which done without any sort of legislative scrutiny. 
Uh, you'll be even surprised to hear that uh, as recently as last week, the premier came on the radio and told uh, Yukoners that he doesn't need legislative oversight on his decision making. It doesn't need legislative oversight on the decisions that they've made with respect to COVID. So as you can imagine, that's a very startling and disturbing uh, behavior for a government. Uh, and in my you know, acceptance speech on Saturday night, I called that out for what it is, a, a grave abuse of, of power. And it sounds like uh, it's a very similar situation to what you're dealing with in Ottawa. Pretty much. And you're seeing it across uh, many countries around the world, how, how governments are using this pandemic as an opportunity to grab power and, and take away uh, some, some freedoms for, for their citizens. So we're looking at a potential election, considering everything goes well in, um, in, in two years or so, or in 18 months, maybe. Um, what are the process, given the pandemic, that you're... How are you able to gear up for that? Well, uh, obviously, you know, the way we, that we all interact and the way that we all reach out to constituents and stakeholders and, and citizens uh, has changed. But for us as a party, we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, obviously, me, I've been the leader now for a, a day and a half or so. And uh, it's, uh, you know, falls to me in a large, uh, in a large way to begin that work. Uh, so for the Yukon Party, we have to start the process of crafting a platform that speaks to the, the grassroots of our party, but also allows us to reach out to Yukoners who, who share our values but haven't you know, previously voted for the Yukon Party. Uh, I've got to begin to put together a slate of candidates that will field uh, in the next election. And of course, as, as you know, uh, you know, it's really important to get, start getting teams of volunteers and organizers together to, uh, to help us uh, push that uh, movement forward. And and uh, prepare for the next election. So we don't know when the next election will be. Uh, it's worth noting that the, the Liberal government here uh, committed to a fixed election date in the last election as a part, you know, as a part of their commitment to electoral reform. Uh, and much like they did in Ottawa, they've abandoned that process and have abandoned that promise. Uh, and they have failed to come up with a fixed election date. So uh, we don't know when the next election will be. It's up to the Premier. Uh, but uh, we're going to be ready, and I'm going to do what I need to do to make sure that this party is is ready to to take down the Liberal government in the next election. So you were campaigning a long time, your former MLA. Uh, what, what have you heard during your time out uh, talking to people? What are their concerns that you might be potentially putting in your platform? Yeah, well, the Yukon Party has always had a, a long history of uh, some foundational values. Uh, obviously, we have a deep respect for taxpayers and, and keeping taxes low spending within our means, keeping balanced budgets here in the territory, uh, and, uh, you know, keeping to the extent we can uh, pressure on the, on the government to, to reduce its uh, ever-growing expansion. Um, we've always stood up for the mining industry. We've always recognized that the, that the natural resources we have in the territory offer opportunities for, for jobs and, op and, and growth here in, in not just the Yukon, but in the entire north. Uh, and we've always stood up for hunters, anglers, and, and outdoors folks who, who want to enjoy our beautiful backyard and, and participate in the recreational opportunities that come with it. But uh, I've, al I've also noted that, that since, the, uh, since the leadership election, I, I want to make sure that we are reaching out to, uh, to some new areas that allow us to attract new supporters to our, to our coalition of voters. Uh, and uh, I've outlined some of that, but I look forward to engaging with our membership to really seek out uh, what the grassroots of our party wants to see and uh, what a platform uh, is going to look like for us that will be successful uh, so that we can take down this liberal government in the next election. Now, no doubt you've heard about this. The Liberals have used an order in council to uh, ban certain types of firearms. What what are you, Connor, saying about that? Well, uh, there are, I have two responses to that. One is, uh, you know, first of all, we've seen a, a similar trend here in Yukon in terms of governing by OIC and, and uh, exercising powers uh, granted to the, the, the government uh, under the, the Civil Emergencies Measures Act, which, uh, you know, has plays a role for sure. But uh, again, that further highlights the need for some scrutiny on these decision making um, processes, because uh, some of the things that have come out have been flawed and in need of some amount of public scrutiny to to improve them. Uh, and this exact, you know, the case that you've suggested in Ottawa with the, the firearms regulation that the Liberal government there has pushed through uh, is a perfect example of that. I don't know if they actually intended to include shotguns, uh, both 10-gauge and 12-gauge shotguns as they, as they did, but uh, I heard on your episode uh, a few weeks ago uh, Mr. Zimmer talking about the, uh, the, the uh, 
perhaps unintended consequences of a poorly thought out regulation in Ottawa. And that's a perfect example of, you know, why Parliament is necessary and why scrutiny is important because it improves the decision making process and allows the government to make better decisions. Now, ultimately, I still think the Liberal government in Ottawa is making a, uh, an error in attacking it this way with, with this issue. Uh, in Yukon, there's a, an incredibly large number of, of responsible law abiding gun owners. Uh, whether it's for you know the recreational uh, aspects of sports shooting, etc., but more importantly, I think uh, and 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 uh, historically, we've got a huge hunting community here in Yukon, both indigenous and non-indigenous, who are going to be significantly negatively affected by by this uh, by this uh, you know overreach by the federal government. So uh, my colleagues in the Yukon Party Caucus have have raised this issue, and I'm going to continue that fight uh, in my new role as leader to stand up for Yukon uh, law-abiding gun owners. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't give you an opportunity to uh, talk about your predecessor, who was in that job for probably the longest I've seen an interim leader in that kind of position. Maybe I'll just open up the floor to let you uh, talk about that. Talk about yeah, Stacey. so uh, Stacey Hazard is one of our six MLAs, and in 2016, after the last election, he, he uh, begrudgingly volunteered to serve as the interim leader uh, to allow for uh, the, the leadership election to, to proceed. Now, now, obviously, for a variety of reasons, that got pushed out and pushed out, and here we are three and a half years later. And uh, let me say, both the Yukon Territory as a whole and the Yukon Party were incredibly well served by Stacey Hazard in his capacity as interim leader of the Yukon Party and leader of the official opposition here. Uh, he did a fantastic job. He really stepped up to the plate and fulfilled that role uh, you know, obviously he he was there a lot longer than he planned to be. Uh, my my understanding is that he's the longest serving uh, interim leader of a political party in a, in any province or territory in Canadian political history. So, uh, an incredible feat to be sure, but also an inspiration for me personally because it's a it's a real uh, honor to be serving with him now uh, as leader, and I'm going to do my best to to live up to the example that he's set uh, in both those capacities. And I think Stacey mentioned many times that length of time, uh, quite often. <laughs> so, uh, Curry, thank you very much for joining us. I have so many more questions, but uh, we're out of time. I do appreciate it. We'll have you on again, and we'll get into uh, a few of the other issues that uh, are affecting you, Connors. Well, thank you very much, Jamie, and thanks for your ongoing support of the North. Uh, I should note, I think that you personally have been in the Yukon more times than our Prime Minister. So uh, <laughs> thank you to, to you and your colleagues for the attention and support you've given to the North. Uh, especially given the, the attention provided by our federal government. It's definitely a beautiful part of this country, and hopefully I'll, I'll be back there soon enough. Thank you very much, Jamie. Okay, thank you very much. That's Curry Dixon. He is the new leader of the Yukon Party, the Conservatives up in that beautiful territory. He is soon to be, and soon going to be, the new Premier of the Yukon. So we will have him on again, we'll talk about the issues affecting the Yukon, uh, because there are so many. So thank you once again for joining us here on The Blueprint. Remember, please like, comment, share, subscribe. Help us push back against the ever-moving liberal agenda. You can also listen to us on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, CastBox, you name it. We're out there and working together to push back against that liberal agenda. Thank you again. We'll be back next Tuesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time with another edition of The Blueprint. Until then, remember, low taxes, less government, more freedom. That's The Blueprint.